Hi, this is Rick Goodman from the University of Nebraska. The question I have um, is primarily for Dr. Kitta, but for any of the three. Um, there is an emphasis on the compositional analysis under OECD and I think under many country guidelines to suggest that the compositional analysis is for safety assessment. But when I think about food and even though I'm in food science, I just look at a small part of it. Many of the things that we look at have very loose connections with safety. So um, in Japan, how do you really connect all of the different components of a food source, like soybean or rice, to safety as opposed to nutrition? I'm not pretty sure if I understand your question uh, well or not. But I think, first of all, we have to remember uh, we have been using the conventional food uh, for everyday life, um, and it is considered as safe. And based on the, the idea, we just compare the new thing is safe or not. So we don't need to necessarily to you know uh, think about the details. I think. So may I follow up with a question? Um, the problem that I have in dealing with that is that we're looking for statistically significant differences between two plants grown in one field at one time under fixed conditions. But that doesn't translate very well into the real food supply that we eat. So I worry at times that we identify things as hazards or risk when we don't really look at it in the real world. The database helps, but it doesn't even answer what is the rice that's eaten in Japan today. It, it's just a snapshot of a few varieties. And when we say safety, then I worry sometimes that we overstate it. Well, that's why uh, I would like to expand the uh, database, because we don't know what the range of the uh, natural variability. And so probably the database which we have is not enough to show the, uh, the range of uh, natural variability. But still, we have been eating the such kind of uh, rice. So, um, am I answering to your question? <laughs> I think so, but, and it is important to expand the database. Um, and even still, then, if the first question is when we find a difference, how far do we have to dig? If we have to just look at the database then and see that the range is within the range, no problem, then that's usually good. But if we say, well, we need more tests because it was a minor difference, then that gets to be very difficult. Well, uh, so far, uh, I haven't seen uh, the composition which is far, far beyond the range of natural, natural variability which we have. So unless you bring the nutritionally uh, modified stuff, I don't think you would see such big differences among the among such kind of nutrients, I think. Uh, I'm uh, Bill Price, retired FDA U.S. Uh, Question, Dr. Kidda, on, on the databases, but don't mean to just put, keep putting you on the spot. But having had some experience with uh, creating OECD documents and looking at many databases, uh, it would appear uh, trying to compare things on an equal basis, like moisture. And I, I think uh, in looking at uh, some of your databases, that it wasn't on a moisture-free basis. And then when you try to compare things like protein, then you have factors, like in the U.S. we've used 6.25, I think in 
not sure the exact factor that you use for soybeans, it's five something. Uh, <coughs> and rice is, is like five, six something. Uh, but anybody has to realize, and, uh, and I think you could probably expand on this, that in looking at the databases and they put up a figure for protein or for any of the things that uh, it, you need to be able to look at it on an equal basis. Uh, and that if you don't realize that it's, it's not on a moisture-free basis or it's not using a different factor, uh, then uh, you, you can't compare them you know, realistically. So uh, maybe your comment on that? Uh, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I think I should have uh, I should have take the same method as the Ibushi has used uh, at the beginning. But uh, we are concentrated on the, the safety assessment, and the the data correction, correction of rice, and uh, I we we just use the the. Uh, official method which have been used in Japan. That's why we couldn't. Um, uh, I didn't choose the same method as the other uh, um, database she used. So I think uh, if I have a chance, I'd like to modify or I'd like to take the uh, new data. But unfortunately, uh, we are uh, out of the budget <laughs> and I cannot <laughs> take new data. But if we have chance, I'd like to try. Thank you very much. Uh, um significantly different from, and I'll be talking a little bit about significance tomorrow, but um, it was the Dr. Kitter's um, flow chart that I was slightly, um, would I like to follow up a little bit on. You said that if there's no statistically significant difference in the data set, it's okay. Endpoints, and you find a data set which shows nothing that's statistically significant, I would be worried about that data set because of the type one error. If you're looking at 100 comparisons, and there aren't around five or six significant, um, just by chance alone, there's something wrong with your data set. Um, and I think that's a, it's one of the flags that says, go and have a look closely if you fail to find things in a big data set which are not significant. Okay, first of all, at the beginning, uh, we make the comparison between the GM uh, crop and its conventional uh, counterpart, which is, uh, which was grown in the same field trial. So the, the data set, the number of data sets are not that big. And if there is any significant di difference there, we have to consider more. But if there are uh, not significant difference there, uh, we just think it's uh, just small variability. My, my point was that if you're looking at a very large number of endpoints in a comparison between two groups and you just use random numbers, you'll find five out of a hundred significant on average by chance alone. So if you don't find anything significant in the data set, there's something a little bit odd about it. No, 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 no. Uh, at the beginning, at the first comparison was between the GM crops and uh, at the si simultaneously, the uh, non-GM crops is grown in the same field. And the comparison is um, performed w between these two sets. So the data set, the number of data sets are not that huge. But, but if you're looking at a very large number of endpoints in your comparison between two groups, and you're making the equivalent of, say, t-tests between group A and group B, and you have 100 different endpoints, <coughs> on assuming they were not um, correlated, which they will be to some extent, you, wouldn't, you would expect, even if there's no difference whatsoever between the two groups, some of the things to be significant just by chance alone. So if you have a data set which has no significant differences in it, mm -hmm. it suggests there's something odd about that data set, which needs investigation. Mm -hmm. But uh, think about the, uh, the conventional food, which we usually eat, which has 
wide range of natural variability, but we consider those foods as safe. But if you take two samples from your conventional food uh -huh. and you measure 100 measures on it, uh -huh. you'll have some of those differences that will be significant just by chance alone. Uh -huh. It's the type 1 error that you will have, and if you don't have it, it suggests that either someone has uh -huh. um, done an incorrect analysis or there's something odd about your data. Uh -huh. We can probably, I mean, I don't, don't want to discuss it. <laughs> well, I'm not a statistician, so I'm not pretty sure, but in, a, in my project at the beginning, we consider the significant difference, but the second, uh, we just consider, we, we emphasize, we uh, look at the, the natural variability. We don't particularly think about significant difference or not, and if each uh, the data falls into the natural variability or not is important. <laughs> differences, the chances of having a situation where there are no differences is very remote. In fact, it's probably very uncommon. Yeah. And, and, and to flag up an investigation. Of Maybe, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can probably discuss more tomorrow. Yes, yeah. yes, very good. Thanks for the question. Another question from the audience? My name is Rod Herman and I'm with Dow AgriSciences. It on now? Yeah. Well, I think it was on before. Okay, my name is Rod Herman. I'm with Dow uh, AgriSciences, and I assure Dr. Lovell we don't get data sets without significant differences between <laughs> <laughs> the uh, transgenic and, and the ISO line. It, and so uh, I think that concern is, is real, but uh, I haven't seen any situations like that. But I, I would like to unfortunately put Dr. Kidda back on the uh, <laughs> on the podium, and I, I believe I heard you say that you, that Japan has looked at 189 different uh, uh, approved 189 different transgenic, uh, and so I'm curious about uh, the first question is how many have you not approved because you found them to be compositionally unsafe? As I know. Um, as I know, I don't see any uh, GM crops which has been rejected because of the compositional uh, difference or significant difference or something like that. As I know, uh, so far, uh, the, the safety issue is not at the of course, we, we uh, assess the safety assessment based on the comparative approach, but uh, not it's not become, it, it won't become the big issue all the time. So, so my follow-up question is, um, if, if you could speculate, how many crops do you think will have to go through those sorts of valuations um, before we uh, are comfortable that the compositional analysis is not adding to the safety assessment? Well, um, I I cannot answer that question because I'm not I'm not sure about that. But uh, probably uh, the same procedure uh, can be accepted for for more. Um, I don't know. But because I think more and more nutritionally uh, modified crop will come up and. Probably we have to keep doing it until we get comfortable. We get a comfortable feeling about it, and I'm not sure about this at this point. Hi, it's Rick Goodman again, sorry, from Nebraska. But I have a question for Rita, if I may. Um, I've seen some recent publications from different countries and different regulators in looking at their approval of an old event. 
So if you think about something like MON810, which was approved in the U.S. in, I think, 1996, roughly, and now it's been licensed to different countries and, and so forth, this last year I reviewed a publication on the safety and they were comparing MON810 to the near isogen. They were actually uh, in germ plasm of another company and it was grown in Spain. So the question I had for the authors was how similar are these to the original MON810 and the, and the near isogen? I mean, how would you approach that? How would you understand the genetic differences in 2010 that was there in 1996? <laughs> of the expression of that event uh, and the, uh, uh, the structural integrity of that event. So we wouldn't ex expect, for example, rearrangements in that introduced DNA represented by MON810. But what you're um, suggesting is that the genetic background uh, is quite probably quite different. Um, in, in Europe, for example, uh, flint germplasm has a, a, a much more dominant place than it does in the U.S. germplasm, where basically uh, we're dealing with uh, yellow dent corn. And uh, so, uh, again, um, it, it going back to the ideal world in event selection, uh, the event selection uh, process identified MON810 as an event that didn't interact with the genetic background that it's in. So the expression doesn't change if it's in um, this hybrid uh, of European origin versus this hybrid of U.S. germplasm origin. And um, now that's not necessarily the case, but um, there may be some interaction, you know, th that's not realized until you go to a different country and you're in entirely different germplasm. Um, but um, um, basically, that's what you're looking at. If, if there's an interaction with the genetic background, um, then differences could come to light uh, in the type of study that you're talking about. And I actually talked to the breeders then in the company that had the germplasm that was under evaluation. And what they suggested was from the breeding set that they were using, there was about a 97% identity expected in the, or homogeneity, if you will. Um, but when we think about then the compositional analysis or possibly expression of allergens and things like that, in addition to the environmental interactions, then you do have uh, genetic differences that I think make it a little bit different in terms of how similar is this to the original comparison? And if you're asking somebody who's a food scientist or an immunologist, it gets different. It's very complex to understand the genetic differences you were talking about in your presentation and how that might impact composition, nutritional components, allergen expression, and things like that. That's a tough thing to communicate, so thank you. Sure. Uh, you know, I think uh, any good uh, original set of studies with, with an event takes a look at the event uh, performance in different genetic backgrounds. Um, and if there's any hint there that there's variability uh, in the expression based on the genetic background, then there would be reason to expect that as you go to vastly different backgrounds, another part of the world, uh, you know, that's going to probably be an even greater factor. Um, but when you don't see any interaction at all with the genome, um, looking at uh, across genetic variability represented in a particular country's germplasm, like U.S., for example, I think the suggestion is quite strong then that there is no interaction with the rest of the genome.
Okay, is this working? Okay. Is this working? Okay, we need lights or one, two. All right. Um, Gerard Barry, International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. And I've got a question for our first two speakers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read conclusion point two from Dr. Mum's presentation and ask you both to comment on it. Um, transgenic events are subjected to intense evaluation and stringent selection prior to commercialization. And Dr. Bravani gave us numbers of the scale of what you start with and what you get down to. But I'd like both of you to think about the numbers and the processes and how much of the variation differences, composition changes, whatever, are taken out during the selection process so we get back something that is as close as we, as the starting material or whatever, and maybe also comment on that when you're doing a back crossing process. Well, the, um, um, I would say that, that we're dealing with, oops, sorry. We're dealing with uh, um, two different pipelines there. So uh, I intense evaluation and stringent selection of events. Um, basically, I, I view that as you get rid of any garbage. Um, and uh, you also um, select the very best, um, the, the most ideal expression of the trait that you're, you're trying to produce. So um, I, I think that that's um, uh, a, a, a great process uh, by, by which to uh, ensure that if there is something commercializable that's been produced through transformation, uh, there's a process by which it will be found. Um, and then m moving it into elite germplasm is another pipeline. And that price process is also very important um, because uh, especially early on in the commercialization of a new event, depending on what the transformant line was, for example, um, it, it, I would be perhaps very concerned to get rid of all the um, DNA that's not the event when I'm moving it into my, my hybrid of choice for conversion. Um, so, so I want to uh, make sure that I'm recapturing all the properties of the target hybrid um, uh, plus the advantages that I've selected for um, in choosing the, the one event for commercialization. So it's two separate processes. Um, I was glad that uh, Laura mentioned it, linkage drag, uh, talked about it a little, uh, again um, uh, a little bit more because um, uh, I believe you were mentioning it in the um, context of Roundup Ready soybeans. Um, it, it, it can uh, be a factor in reducing the, um, the advantage of the transgenic uh, trait that you're producing. So the conversion needs to be done very well and very cleanly um, to, to make sure that you're getting the full advantage of the transgenic event that's been developed. Bo both are essential. Um, you, you can have a great event selection process, but a not so great breeding process uh, to introduce that event into different genetic backgrounds that really waters down um, the, uh, the effect of the event, the advantage of it. I would like to concur that those are two parallel processes. And from a regulatory science point of view, we always did not want to be the limiting step. So it was very nice to have the breeding process go on, which had definite time constraints. And you saw the number of generations that needed to be undertaken to integrate something in, in corn. And it was during that time that all the safety studies are being done. And and so that's very nice for corn. The different, the situation is different in something like potato where you don't go through the breeding process and you identify your elite event and then everything stops. Well, that's not exactly true, but then you have to do the whole safety assessment and it, it's during that period of time where they're multiplying the seed potatoes 
in anticipation of getting approvals, but you, you're not going through the breeding process that um, Rita described. So I do think that those are separate but parallel processes. We have a question from the webcast, uh, so I'll, I'll uh, take this question now. Um, and it states, uh, this is a question for Dr. Mum. Given the majority of transgenic corn hybrids on the market are generated through back crossing and events uh, selected through rigorous agronomic testing, what do you think about the relevance of compositional safety assessments for GM crops? I think it's sort of getting at the role of, of the agronomic testing. There's been a very conservative approach that has been taken since uh, the mid-90s when um, uh, transgenic traits were first commercialized in crops. Um, I don't think that that's been a, a, a bad approach. Um, um, however, I do think that we've learned a lot um, over, over the last 15 plus years. Um, I, I would also encourage uh, taking into account uh, the, the particular trait that's being developed. So um, we, we've, we've evolved um, with respect to the transgenic traits that are being produced. So we started with herbicide tolerance and insect resistance, and now we're moving into um, some stress tolerances, um, compositional changes, um, nutritional benefits, et cetera. Um, so I think it really also depends upon the trait that, that's being developed. It's, it's difficult sometimes to make blanket statements um, uh, when you're talking about not only different traits, but different events that have been produced with different technologies and based on different genes and modes of action. It's, it's really tough, I think, sometimes to make a, a blanket statement. Any other questions from the audience? We have about three minutes left. All right. This question is off the leader and Laura. It has to do, uh, probably can do twofold. Uh, first question is, how many generations do you need to go through to get a, uh, a plant for collection for composition data? How many adequate to ensure that the uh, Conservative sort of gene is going to be stable and that you're going to be able to collect your composition data from that generation. And then the second question would be for Rita is what do you know about the uh, production of uh, drought resistant corn this year? How did it fare? We have about one minute, so <laughs> brief answer, please. Um, how many generations in order to have the <coughs> trade stabilized before you do the compositional analysis? I think that's a, that, that's a good question, and again, it would depend on your crop. If it's a vegetatively propagated crop, you do it on the one that you've got because that's all you're going to get. But nevertheless, you do it probably for more than one year. Um, different regions of the world have different requirements, and some have a number of locations that they want compared. And it doesn't matter if you do those. It's a cumulative number of locations. You can do them all in one year, or you can do them in two separate years, or three separate years, or, or whatever the case may be. Um, I have to say I think it's case by case. Uh, for something like corn, the desire is to have it in as close to a finished product as possible, but I don't know that that's always the case that, that has been taken, the approach has been taken. One factor that, one factor that, thank you. One factor that would play into um, the answer to your question uh, would, would be what the source is of the event. So if the source of the event is something that's an elite commercial line, um, it's probably less of a factor than if that uh, source of the event is
something that's not commercial quality, uh, not commercial germplasm at all. Because if you remember um, from the back cross, uh, that slide that I showed with respect to uh, getting b back the um, qualities and the germplasm of the recurrent parent, um, it's not until the back cross six that we're at 99% um, uh, uh, on average of regaining that I think I think we'll have to stop plan. there. I appreciate that. Um, but there will be lots of chance <laughs> for discussion in the round tables. Uh, they are coming up. Uh, maybe I should turn it over to Kate. But before I do, let's thank the speakers for such a good Thank you very much. <laughs>